So good afternoon and very well welcome to the session one, Leaving No One Behind. From global commitments to national experience to set up a framework for evaluating sustainable development goals. So the key objective of this particular session is to discuss emerging lessons and experiences in integrating gender equality and human rights perspective in evaluation of SDGs. My name is Inga Schnukaite, and I am from UN Women Independent Evaluation Office. And it is my pleasure to chair this session and panel today. So in the next hour, we will hear from our presenters, and then we will leave half an hour for any questions and comments that you may have. So first, so I would like to start from the presentations, not from, from introducing the presenters. Mr. Alan Fox is a Chief of Section of Corporate Evaluation at the Independent Evaluation Office of UNDP and a focal point of UNDP Executive Board. Today he is going to share with us how UNDP learned about the rights of persons and disabilities in their evaluation. Ms. Alfa Sukri Sharif is Member of Parliament of Tunisia. She is also a Vice Chair of Parliamentary Network on the World Bank and IMF. Today, she is going to present on public policy evaluation as a true exercise for democracy and governance. Ms. Alejandra Founders is a Chilean consultant, lecturer, teacher, and evaluator of various programs commissioned by government in Latin America. She is also a founder of an organization called Gender Equality and Equity Inclusion. So she is going to share some lessons from her experiences in integrating gender and human rights approach in national evaluation systems in Latin America. Finally, Ms. Adeline Sibanda, she's a president of African Evaluation Association, and she also sits on the board of IOC and is a member of Eval Partners Management Group as well as Eval Gender Management Group. So Adeline will share with us today some lessons from Eval Gender experiences working on promoting gender responsive and equity focused evaluation of SDGs. So very warm well, welcome to the panel again, again. And I hope that you're gonna enjoy our presentations and we have a lively discussion after that. So without a further ado, I would like to start with my presentation. So in my presentation, I'm going to share and talk about young women's approach and experience in supporting sustainable development goals. I will focus on four key topics. Why we need to evaluate SDGs from a gender-responsive lens. What is gender-responsive evaluation? What are the strategies for integrating evaluation SDGs? And share with you some final thoughts on evaluation of SDG challenge. First of all, I would like to start by showing the advocacy video for evaluation of SDGs prepared by UN Women Independent Evaluation Office that highlights that evaluation should be at the heart of the sustainable development goals. Some MDG targets were not met. Why? What can we do differently this time? What have we learned? Two key lessons. Lesson number one. We need a strong monitoring and evaluation framework to provide better evidence for learning, decision-making, and accountability. Lesson number two, progress overall does not mean progress for all. Building on the lessons learned from MDGs, the SDGs differ in five ways. Number one, SDGs were identified through an inclusive and participatory process to ensure ownership. Number two, SDGs are universal. They commit both developed and developing countries alike. Number three, SDGs are comprehensive and integrated as they take care of the so-called five Ps. People, 
That is human development. Planet. That is sustainable development. Prosperity. That is elimination of income poverty. Peace. As development is not possible without peace. Partnerships. As given the complexity of SDGs, no one can do it alone. Number four. SDGs pledge no one being left behind and inclusion of groups traditionally discriminated against, marginalized, or excluded. Number five. SDGs are committed to adopt a robust and inclusive follow-up and review framework based on country-led evaluations. The SDGs pledge to the follow-up and review mechanisms on the one side, and the no one left behind on the other side, keeps us focused on ensuring everyone benefits from the promise of the SDGs. This pledge also ensures that human rights, social justice, and gender equality approaches are at the forefront, as stated in the 2020 Global Evaluation Agenda. For the evaluation community, the SDGs are an opportunity as well as a challenge because of their complexity and the methodological, political, social, and financial implications associated with evaluating them using an equity-focused and gender-responsive lens. But we have good news. Number one, a vibrant global multi-stakeholders evaluation movement already exists, including government representatives, UN, voluntary organizations for professional evaluation, VOPEZ, parliamentarians, academic institutions, and the private sector, a community which has been working throughout 2015 to prepare for these new challenges. Celebrating the International Year of Evaluation to advocate and promote evaluation and evidence-based policymaking. Strengthening existing partnerships while creating new partnerships. Strengthening gender-responsive evaluation within the UN and at national level. Number two, a series of background material and e-learning already exists to guide equity-focused and gender-responsive evaluations. What can you do? Engage and become an activist for equity-focused and gender-responsive evaluations. Partner with others to achieve a more coherent and impactful approach. Move beyond box ticking. Yes, we need to disaggregate data, but what is truly necessary is to understand the structural causes of inequality, power relationships, social norms, cultural beliefs, and how policies are addressing them to transform our world. Increase your capacity to integrate a gender and human rights perspective in evaluation. Join the online discussion through Eval Gender Community of Practice. The world has thrown down the gauntlet to the evaluation community. Act now. I think this video summarizes very well some of the themes that I would like to explore further in my presentation. So let me start. Gender and human rights responsive evaluation helps to reduce inequality and it brings everybody along. This type of evaluation is specially aimed to reach those traditionally most marginalized and left behind. This approach is particularly promising in the implementation of sustainable development goals. There are two specific goals, goal five and 10, are dedicated to gender equality and reduced inequalities. The ideas of gender equality, human rights, and no one left behind are central to the 2030 agenda, and they have to be integrated at all stages of the implementation of sustainable development goals. The agenda has a very strong focus on the poorest, most marginalized, and further left behind. This challenge could be addressed only through transformative change and addressing the root causes of discrimination. According to the United Nations Institute for Social Development, transformation requires attacking the root causes that generate and reproduce economic, social, political, and environmental problems and inequities, not merely their symptoms. So if we understand transformative change as a long-term process, which requires both individual agency and collective actions by societies. So addressing these root causes will require a number of actions. So first of all, changes in economic and political and social structures. 
that should result in visible and measurable economic and political empowerment of the groups that are mostly marginalized and disadvantaged, sustainable production and consumption, power reconfigurations, so including active citizen citizenship with greater agency of civil society organizations and social movements, and of course, greater gender equality in all spheres. The transformative standalone goal for gender equality is grounded in the understanding that structural causes of inequality lie in the systems of discrimination. So what are very often justified in the name of culture, history, group identity, or policy rationalities that assume that we just have to liberate the market to empower women. To address these types of systems of discrimination, so the goal seeks to end violence against women and girls and provide services to victims, also to end the histories of underinvestment in expanding women's and girls' capabilities and resources and reverse systematic marginalization of women from public and private decision making. So furthermore, technology should serve for women and girls' empowerment, and governments should adopt and strengthen policies and legislation for the promotion of gender equality. So all of this could be done through eco-social policies and, of course, innovation. When it comes to gender equality, there is still lots of work to be done. According to the World Economic Forum Gender Gap Report, if we're going to proceed in such a pace, so it will take us 50 years to achieve parity in politics, 81 years parity in economic empowerment, 95 years in parity in girls' secondary education, and another interesting statistics, 158 years to close the gender gap in North America. So therefore, the gender responsive evaluation that keeps an eye on inequalities as a key, is a key to achieving sustainable development goals for everyone. It is an approach that can dramatically accelerate the progress as it goes beyond the measurement of indica indicators and helps to answer the questions. So are we doing the right thing for gender equality? Are we doing those things right? So let me turn now to, to discuss what is gender responsive evaluation. Gender responsive evaluation is a lens. It is a way of framing an evaluation to reduce inequalities. Gender responsive evaluation considers the structures that contribute to gender inequalities and the challenges with structures and contributes to the realization of women's rights and women's empowerment. Gender responsive evaluation is intentional. It intentionally explores gender equality issues through questions and criteria, and it intentionally uses methods and processes which are sensitive for gender equality principles and perspectives at every stage of evaluation process. Gender responsive evaluation builds understanding for sustainable development progress. The goal of gender responsive evaluation is to reduce gender inequalities by first evaluating progress towards the SDG 5 and its sub goals. Second, evaluating how all the SDGs contribute to gender equality outcomes. And third, evaluating the overall contribution of sustainable development goals policy framework at the country level. And also identifying any contributing factors or challenges. The interventions that aim to address gender equality tend to be very complex. They are concerned with the changes at the policy level, institutions, communities, and also at the individual agency level. So it is not about delivering service. It's actually about changing the hearts and minds of people. The evaluators have to draw on a variety of evaluation uh, approaches and methods that can range from system thinking, feminist theory and research, impact evaluations, 
as well as participatory evaluations. The mixed method approach and application of gender lens are crucial for evaluating these complex programs and policies. So let me briefly discuss so what are the strategies for integrating gender responsive evaluation of SDGs. UN Women approach to supporting SDGs is systematic. It spans work on enabling environment, institutional capacities, and individuals, and also focuses on very strong interlinkages of these building blocks. We work with existing strong multi-stakeholder partnerships, such as EVAL Partners, EVAL Gender Plus, and United Nations Evaluation Group. So national evaluation capacity development is one of the key areas of UN Women Independent Evaluation Office work plan. And so far, we use sustainable development goals as an entry to reinforce the gender responsive aspect of national evaluation capacity development. So one of the promising uh, strategies in supporting uh, enabling environment for evaluation through development of gender and equity responsive national evaluation policies and frameworks. According to the mapping of evaluation policies conducted by EVAL partners in 2015, only 20 countries have evaluation policies or evaluation frameworks, and only three countries have references to gender equality in this type of policies. So to address this gap in 2015, we developed a how-to guide on integrating gender equality and social equity into national policies and systems. So the key achievements in national evaluation capacity developments were also the integration of gender perspective into the global evaluation agenda, publishing the guidance on evaluating SDGs with no one left behind lens, which is broadly available to everybody. They can use it in different languages. And we also provided technical assistance to 11 countries. And actually my colleague Adeline will talk in more detail uh, how about gender engaged in delivering this type of uh, service. We can draw the following lessons from young women engagements from SDGs. First, that it is very important to avoid isolated initiatives and instead focus on multi-stakeholder partnerships. Important not to seek change in silos, tar target systemic change through national policies and systems. And don't just tick the box. So the habit of gender response evaluation should be the norm. Dig deep beyond the aggregate indicators and progress for all doesn't mean the progress for all. And national evaluation capacity development is not just a training. So it is innovation, it is technology, and it's also about shifting the mindsets. So the sustainable development goals, they represent a significant opportunity and step forward for evaluation. As evaluators, we are sometimes reminded that evaluation as such, it doesn't take people to the street. Even it should. But gender equality and social justice issues, so they do. So therefore, it's very important that we position evaluation in service of uh, solving these critical societal problems. So it is imperative that monitoring and review process of sustainable development goals should leverage added value of evaluation for smart and evidence-based informed policies. No one left behind and gender responsive evaluation should be the norm in evaluating SDGs. And we do not need to reinvent the wheel here because there is a body of experience and existing knowledge on it and good practices in evaluating national evaluation policies, including from gender perspective. Finally, national evaluation capacity development and country ownership so is a key for evaluating and achieving transformative change. So thank you very much for your attention. So I will end here. And now I will invite Mr. Alan Fox to present on evaluating inclusiveness. You've just had your lunch. You're beginning to settle in. You're getting tired. So indulge me for two minutes. Stand up. And then look around. 
Look at these glass balls and the, uh, and, the, and the interesting things that you can see. And try to smell a little bit. I know it's carpets and things, but try to use the, the senses of your, of your nose. Listen, and you've been listening quite a bit. Now you'll have to listen some more. You can be seated. So other than waking you up after lunch, why did I do that? Because one billion people in this, in this world have difficulties with one or more of the things that you just did. They have ambulatory issues, they have auditory issues, they have sensory issues that we don't always pay attention to. I sat in on Sunday when we were having this, the safety and security briefing for this event, and it struck me. There were no requests for sign language, there were no requests for special services because people were uh, handicapped uh, physically and needed some assistance. So when we talk about leaving no one behind and when we as evaluators are trying to evaluate how we work in the situation with disabilities, sometimes we have to recognize that we are not representative of the persons that we're trying to analyze. When we did this disabilities evaluation a year ago, the first thing that came was, was told to us by the uh, organizations who we worked with was nothing about us without us. If you're going to come and evaluate our work, let's make sure we have persons in, the organ in your organization who actually have experienced what we've experienced and understand some of the real difficulties we face. So whenever we, those of us who are doing evaluations, come to deal with the persons, uh, to, to, to situations with disabilities, I think first of all we have to recognize how blessed we are to have the opportunity to be able to use all our senses, to be able to understand what evaluation can provide in, in terms of this work. I want to give you in just a brief amount of time a little bit of a sense of what we did in this uh, disabilities evaluation, what we learned. It was a fairly hard-hitting evaluation. UNDP was not pleased with it. Um, but it did wake them up in the sense that, that when we talk about leaving no one behind, when we talk about the most marginalized members of our society, we also have to be very aware of the difficulties that persons with disabilities face. And it's actually very appropriate to have this as a discussion also with gender because we find that persons with, uh, with, with disabilities, who, uh, who, uh, is, uh, it's especially an issue for, for women and girls. You press this one for me. So, as we always do, we talk a little bit about the evaluation scope. We wanted to see the strategic relevance of disability inclusive development uh, uh, for UNDP as observed through its strategic priorities. Do we see persons with disabilities included in our strategic plans? We wanted to see its global positioning and partnerships uh, with, with, uh, 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 in this space, in the disabilities inclusive development space. Of course, we wanted to do project and program analysis. We wanted to see what those projects looked like and were they being uh, done well. And we wanted to in, in, very much look at the internal aspects. Are we as an organization with 130 country offices uh, um, and, and working in 170 countries, do we actually have persons with disabilities who work for us? Are we a, a, an embracing organization for that? And finally, we wanted to say, well, what's the best practices? What are other organizations doing? Our, our colleagues from UN Women and elsewhere, what are they doing in terms of uh, this type of activity? So that was our scope. As many of you know, as we, when we're doing qualitative evaluation, we want to now set up a theory of change. And if the organization itself didn't set up a theory, we ourselves should try to expect what were the inputs, outputs, outcomes, and what are the overall impacts that they're trying to achieve? Um, and in this case, we wanted very much to take from the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities to have that as a driving force to what those impacts would be. The social model of disability implemented that addresses attitudinal, environmental, institutional, and communication barriers 
that hinder the full and effective participation of disabled people on an equal basis with others. The model recognizes that the costs of inclusion are investment that enhances the social and economic life of the country. That to us is an impact that we would want to be building for because, of course, UNDP, just like most of your countries, are in the midst of trying to implement the, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. It was ratified, uh, it was signed in 2006, ratified in 2008, one of the fastest conventions ever to, to reach entering into force. Uh, it has 174 um, uh, signatories to it. And um, I'm sorry, 160 signatories, 174 who have ratified it. Uh, so I would imagine each and every one of your countries uh, has, has, has ratified the Convention on the Rights of, of Persons with Disabilities. We did a global study. We went to 11 countries. We interviewed over 300 people. We did a survey. Um, we looked at the, a global portfolio of over 300 projects uh, in order to get some understanding of how UNDP is working globally in this area. And we used the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities as the organizing force uh, in, in our analysis which of course recognizes accountability, accessibility, participation and inclusion and non-discrimination as the key elements of what, uh, we, uh, what our countries should be doing in terms of enabling uh, the rights of persons with disabilities. The Millennium Development Goals made no mention of persons with disabilities. There was no specific reference whatsoever. But as we now talk about the Sustainable Development Goals, we clearly see that there's been a major change in that, in that consideration. There are now seven direct references, nine indicators um, that are specific to, uh, or that make a specific reference to persons with, with dis disabilities. Uh, and in particular, in terms of the quality of education, uh, economic growth, reduced inequalities, um, sustainable cities and transportation systems, uh, and then um, uh, uh, ensuring that we have uh, quality data that can allow us to understand um, uh, the, the numbers of persons who have disabilities and how they're being served. So, we, we finished up this work and we came up with a number of key findings that uh, in some cases were quite hard hitting for the organization. We found that there was inconsistent tracking of support to persons with disabilities and uneven efforts to mainstream across countries. We found there was insufficient attention to the severe problems faced by persons with disabilities that were affected by crisis, crisis uh, settings. We found too few examples of targeted interventions in support of women with disabilities. We found that joint programming, while modest, actually there was some very interesting uh, and successful and innovative programs, and there's a, an integrated joint effort on the UN uh, program on the rights of persons with disabilities that we actually uh, elevated as a great example of how the UN agencies can work well together when, uh, when they put their mind to it uh, uh, in, in these kinds of uh, uh, situations. And we found, unfortunately, that there was no real effort to employ persons with disabilities and some of the facilities of UNDP are not accessible. Interestingly, or maybe you won't be surprised, this was uh, a bit uh, of concern to UNDP management when we came out with this. Um, and they were initially defensive, but then extremely supportive. And what we've seen in terms of their management response and in their actions afterwards is they realized there's a whole lot more that they can do in terms of, of, of ensuring that persons with disabilities are not left out. We looked at 18 different organizations, both within UN and uh, within the uh, international development community and uh, companies to say, what are, the, what are the lessons learned? What are they doing that we should be emulating or thinking about? And when we do evaluations that maybe need to be a part of our recommendations piece, make disability inclusiveness a priority, develop mainstream guidelines and accessibility standards, provide sufficient funding for this kind of work, build internal capacity, and in particular, what we're finding, and it's gonna be very important in the SDG analyses that we do, is there has to be disaggregated data. If you don't know 
what the extent of the issues are, what the number of persons dealing with disabilities are, you're going to have a great difficulty being able to see how you address those needs. Recruit persons with disabilities. You know, we, we tend to take approach that, that persons with disabilities need services. And what the CRPD says is that persons with disabilities need rights and they need opportunities. And we, we have to, we don't, we can't, we shouldn't confuse the two. Develop and implement policy of reasonable accommodation. If, if, you, if, the, if the government is, is creating a program for persons with disabilities, let's ensure that they also provide a little bit of additional support so those persons can actually do the work that they're very qualified to do, but sometimes it's a little slower, a little bit more difficult because they have issues that need to be overcome. So we came up with a series of recommendations to UNDP on, our, on strategic and corporate work, on their global partnerships, and by the way, when we worked on this uh, uh, evaluation, we included a, a, a reference group that was taken from the, uh, the International Disabilities Alliance, which has chapters all over, the, uh, all over the world. And it's a very important organization for us to be working with. Um, as well as UN and other agencies, we did uh, uh, recommendations on UNDP programming in terms of how they collect data how they mainstream the better, do a better job of mainstreaming this work into development programming. We suggested in a very practical way that they need to audit all their facilities so that we understand whether there are difficulty, that whether persons from the community who want to access UNDP's work can actually get to it. And I think you've all seen offices where you come in and you immediately have to go up a flight of steps and there's no elevator available. I mean, there are some basic things that we can do uh, in terms of not only our recommendations, but our own programs to make sure that people have access. And to do the effort to provide reasonable accommodation and to try to uh, ensure that we have recruitment. So let me conclude with just a few ideas in terms of uh, what this means for us as evaluators, some of which I've already uh, uh, mentioned. Number one, we have to be very clear on the scope, definition, type, and duration of what we're talking about because the first thing that persons with disabilities will tell you is that there's no one size fits all. The kinds of needs that persons have who have uh, ambulatory issues are difficult, di very different than the persons who have cognitive issues and, and sight and, and, and so on. So we have to be clear when we're trying to do an evaluation or we're trying to come up with recommendations that they fit the audience, they fit the target group that we're talking about. As I mentioned, we have to be clear that we're in a rights-based space. We're not in a service space. Those rights may include certain services, but we have to be clear on the distinction. And we have to ask, where's the data? And it's going to be one of your big evaluability issues when you come to this, because sometimes you're going to find we've not disaggregated the data. We don't know how many persons with disabilities that, that, that we're dealing with. And that's going to be one of our critical challenges whenever we uh, take a look at this work. And then, as I say, nothing about us without us. If you're about to do an evaluation that involves disabilities, let's find people from the community who understand these issues. We worked hard at it. We had to make some changes to the way we evaluated in order to ensure that, that, that they could participate. But it came back a hundredfold in terms of understanding and the quality of our work. So that was just a, a quick run through the disabilities world as part of our leaving no one behind. Um, we uh, uh, have it, as, as with all of the evaluations for the UNDP, they are publicly available, they are posted on our, our websites, um, and uh, uh, we certainly, uh, uh, we even created a summary so that there's a small several page piece that uh, people can look through to get a gist of what we are talking about. We welcome your consideration of that, and, and we welcome also your opportunity to do as we did, as we were pushed to do, to take a look at how our programs are dealing with people with disabilities. Thank you. I'm really very pleased to share with you the commitment of a member of parliament on evaluation at this moment of a new era of SDGs to shape efficient policies with principle of no one left behind and with a gender lens equity. How to achieve inclusive growth to all citizens, especially to vulnerable community. Let me tell you, is it the green one? <laughs> Sorry. 
So, the outline of this presentation, the let me tell you the context and the history of the Global Parliamentarian Forum for Evaluation, the experiences of engaging parliament, parliamentarians in evaluation, the role of parliamentarians, and the special case of Tunisia, working on gender equity challenges. Let me tell you how and when this idea starts. It was gathered in 2008 by a Sri Lankan member of parliament, Honorable Kabir, and in 2013, he organized the first parliamentarian panel during evaluation conclave in Kathmandu, and 2015, the Global Parliamentarian Forum on Evaluation was born. The idea was spread in the region to uh, the Middle East, North Africa, to America, to Asia, to all over the world. So, okay, we create this forum, the family of evaluation become bigger, reach almost all continents, organizing conferences in fancy hotels, discovering other countries and culture, but more seriously, sharing the same objectives and as member of parliament, the main objective is to get re-elected and not always re-elected, but also, more seriously, to maintain the credibility of the person, the credibility of the policies. So our main objective is to offer a new culture of evaluation to all politicians, to use evidence of nat for national policy with the partnerships of academic, civil societies to present pragmatic speech, move from populism and criticism to evidence-based policy and deliver better policies for all. So here, engaging parliamentarians in evaluation, it was a Tunisian parliament. So we are presenting citizen voices and it's a tool of transparency for a better governance. As member of parliament, this is, will be the role. To, to implement the Sustainable Development Goals, to go for equitable development, to make the Parliament as a platform and promote evaluation. We have to work with peoples, for peoples, go with partnership, different brands, take care of our planet, share the prosperity, and build peace around. Use evidence from evaluations for parliamentarian debates. The political will in set up the agenda of 2030 give new opportunities and challenges on implementing SDGs. Our main objective is evaluation, evaluation, and evaluation. And at Global Parliamentarians Forum for Evaluation, the objectives are to enhance the evaluation, technical capacity of parliament, to advocate more parliamentarians to promote evaluation function and culture and to mobilize to strengthen capacity at national level. We need some tools for this. So to reach more parliamentarians, we make eval stories to talk about evaluations in the parliament. To facilitate information, we create platform, we make webinars, and we share those experience and the knowledge. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me talk about a country that I know well, my country, Tunisia, to present you the challenge for gender equality. Tunisia is a startup democracy, a successful story in the Arab Spring, present new constitution, one of the best of the world, I'm not the only one to say it. One million women go and vote during elections out of one million and seven thousand. By law, there is no discrimination against women. In the Constitution, a woman can be president. Finally, I can run for it. In the International Convention, CEDO, Tunisia lifted every key reservation against discrimination, uh, against discrimination for women. In the Labor Code, there is equal remuneration for men and women. It's not a dream, it's the reality. But we register so many paradigms and paradoxes. Are we giving to men and women equal chances and equal opportunities? Let me go to three areas. The first, the political area. Women represent only 34% of members of parliament. 
only three women ministers, only 5%, and women governor, just one, 4% in the whole country. Education. There is free access to education, even at university, and obligatory starting at six years. But just two out of three graduates are women. Employment, even though two out of three graduates are women, the unemployment rate of women graduates is almost the double than men. With those figures in mind, and as legislator, we try to advocate for evaluation. After six years of revolution, what can we do to alleviate this disparity? How to reduce inequality with the gender lens for sustainable development goals? We focus on legal framework and we have ratified we get some achievement and we are proud of it. We have ratified no economic exploitation for women, electoral low parity, 50% head of the list men and 50% head of the list women, regulation for investment, giving incentives for women entrepreneurs, and ending violence against women. But to implement those laws, we need the means to achieve ambitions. This is why we are advocating for budget gender sensitive to allocate resources for national strategy on gender equity. It isn't just giving resources to Minister of Women or Minister of Budget, but to integrate the logic of no one left behind in every policy, no women, no youth, no disabled, targeting every vulnerable community. I strongly, be I strongly believe that a public policy Evaluation is a true exercise of democracy and good governance, which can restore public confidence and improve public policy. We must reassert the place of evaluation in the democratic project, the commitment of parliamentarians through evaluation, the opening data, the promotion of innovation, makes possible to build a more transparent society and participate to an inclusive growth where women are not isolated from sustainable development. Parliamentarians as policy makers are the main users of evaluation finding, so they need gender disaggregated data and information for better policy, for um, evidence-based policy. Parliamentarians demand national evaluation policy and emphasize evidence-based. At the labor level, we were funding a project uh, how to improve um, to, and to reach the objective of 35% of women participation in active population by 2020. And we are working with different stakeholders, with um, the BIRD and with the UN Women. And uh, we invite you to follow this project. Thank you very much. Y es que por este lugar privilegiado que tenemos quienes estamos sentados aquí adelante, eh, podemos observar un poco lo que pasa en esta sala. Entonces, una confesión en dos sentidos. Primero, agradecerles la atención y, y, y el haber vencido las ganas de la siesta a esta hora. Eh, pero también porque durante el inicio de esta sesión, en los primeros 20 minutos... Eh, ingresaron a esta sala a lo menos 17 personas que contabilicé que no se sentaron en la sala. Y no se sentaron porque los asientos de atrás de la sala estaban casi todos ocupados. Sin embargo, aquí en la primera fila tenemos 18 asientos reservados que están vacíos. Entonces creo que esa es una primera reflexión que tenemos que hacer a la luz de este panel y de la gran consigna que tenemos por delante y el desafío que tenemos por delante para que nadie se nos quede atrás, eh, es que tenemos que cambiar también las formas de cómo nos organizamos, de cómo entendemos estos espacios de aprendizaje, de compartir experiencias, precisamente para que nadie se nos quede atrás y abandone estos espacios para compartir experiencias. Eh, entonces, bueno, yo lo que quiero compartir con ustedes es una iniciativa que hicimos en conjunto con ONU Mujeres y con otros actores. Perdón, mejor hablo desde acá. Ahí sí. Eh, en América Latina, en el conjunto de los países de América Latina, en donde quisimos de alguna manera visibilizar 
cómo estaban las instituciones públicas abordando los asuntos de género en la evaluación. Sí. Y, eh, y entonces empezamos a, a investigar de qué se trataba esto de las agencias de evaluación en la región, qué significaba incluir enfoque de género en un contexto de agencias que se habían estado instalando en los últimos años. Y es así como en el año 2014 decidimos hacer un mapeo eh, sobre estos asuntos porque no sabíamos nada de cómo los gobiernos, los estados, estaban incluyendo o no el enfoque de género en la evaluación. Entonces, en este estudio llegamos a eh, concluir hallazgos y conclusiones muy interesantes Ustedes pueden encontrar los resultados de este mapeo en una publicación, está en inglés y en español, eh, tanto en el sitio web de ONU Mujeres, como de CLEAR, como de mi propia institución, de Inclusión y Equidad. Y eh, allí hay un análisis mucho más exhaustivo de lo que yo les voy a mostrar hoy día, porque en realidad lo que me interesa compartir con ustedes son más bien algunas conclusiones y algunas señales que nos dio este estudio respecto de los desafíos que tenemos con relación a los ODS. Entonces, este estudio, les decía, se hizo en 18 países de la región. Hicimos y profundizamos esto en estudios de caso en tres países que tenían más avanzados sus sistemas de evaluación, eh, como México, un poco menos avanzado, medianamente avanzado en Ecuador, y un eh, inicio, una actividad muy incipiente de agencia de evaluación en el caso del de Paraguay. ¿Qué es lo que nos arrojó principalmente eh, este estudio? Algunos de los hallazgos son que la función de evaluación en nuestros gobiernos en América Latina, en estos 18 países, eh, es bastante reciente. O sea, tenemos instituciones que surgieron a finales de los años 90, el 89, el 90, hasta el 99, 2000, eh, con una dinámica muy incipiente, que básicamente lo que hacían era dar seguimiento a las metas de los gobiernos y estaban alojados con pequeñas estructuras de comités de asesores, básicamente en instancias dependientes de la presidencia. Y así, conforme fueron pasando los años, la década del 2000, la década pasada, o sea, estamos hablando de fenómenos o situaciones muy, muy recientes, recién en la década pasada comienza a instalarse una capacidad de manera mucho más sistemática y más sustantiva en los distintos países. Eh, y el año 2004 fue el año en que se generan eh, mayor cantidad o mayor número de institucionalidad pública especializada o agencias especializadas en asuntos de evaluación, monitoreo o seguimiento en los distintos países de América Latina. Ahora, respecto de la dependencia institucional de estas organizaciones, la gran mayoría de ellas eh, tenía una dependencia vinculada o a las propias presidencias, porque como decía, el rol fundamental era el de dar seguimiento a las metas de gobierno. Y en segundo lugar, respecto de sus ministerios de planificación, también orientadas y muy, eh, muy orientadas e involucradas con todo el proceso que se instaló en la región respecto de gestión por resultados y por lo tanto el instalar estas instituciones tenía y obedecía también a esa lógica de desarrollo institucional. Y solo en el caso de México se ha logrado a la fecha contar con una institucionalidad autónoma eh, y que tiene, por lo tanto, un ejecutivo, donde también el poder ejecutivo tiene presencia en ese consejo, sin embargo, es la única institución independiente y autónoma eh, en relación al conjunto de la institucionalidad que se ha creado. Algunas de las funciones... Ay, algunas de las funciones claves en asuntos de, de seguimiento y evaluación de esta nueva institucionalidad, eh, está fundamentalmente referida a promover, proporcionar el apoyo técnico a otros organismos del Estado que venían desarrollando seguramente evaluaciones con mayor tiempo, 
eh, y que estaban vinculadas fundamentalmente a los sectores sociales. O sea, las instituciones de salud, de educación o las que están vinculadas a la ejecución de programas contra la pobreza son aquellas que tenían una expertise, una experiencia más desarrollada en evaluación y por lo tanto estas agencias eh, del Estado eh, comenzaron a desarrollar procesos de apoyo técnico y metodológico a esas instancias de manera de generar instrumentos más estandarizados y ese tipo de de iniciativas, pero también otras estaban vinculadas a evaluación de programas de gobierno, muchos de los cuales eran programas de inversión en el área de infraestructura y también muchos de los cuales eran de las áreas sociales. Sin embargo, todas ellas, el 100% de las agencias creadas en la región, estaban orientadas al seguimiento de metas de gobierno. Entonces, ese es un tema clave y no menor para efecto de la medición de los ODS. Porque quienes van, en realidad, a desarrollar evaluaciones y que van a informar a la comunidad internacional respecto a los avances de los ODS son precisamente los gobiernos. Eh, seguramente muchos de, de los gobiernos de nuestros países están aquí presentes en esta sala. Entonces, hay ahí una, un, un punto, una inquietud, un llamado a mirar las funciones que se están desarrollando actualmente en las agencias institucionales de los gobiernos, dado que eh, precisamente hay un énfasis muy fuerte respecto del de, eh, seguimiento de metas de gobierno, más eh, que en evaluaciones de programas, que además tampoco sabemos hoy día, porque esto fue una foto del año 2014, tampoco sabemos hoy día si es que muchos de esos programas evaluados responden también al tipo de iniciativas que queremos y que necesitamos como comunidad internacional que se desarrollen a la luz de los ODS. ¿Qué pasó con la inclusión del enfoque de género? ¿Con qué nos encontramos? Principalmente con que habían dos tipos de mecanismos o de fórmulas de inclusión. Solo seis países de los 18 países tenían mecanismos o fórmulas directas de incluir el enfoque de género ya sea a través de sus instrumentos oficiales, ya sea a través de los términos de referencia que incluían el enfoque de género en el llamado a, a, la, a ofertas de, de evaluación, eh, o ya sea en la utilización de indicadores específicos en las evaluaciones que incluían el enfoque igualdad de género. Y el resto de los países utilizaba, cuando utilizaba, que eran solo 12 países, eh, fórmulas indirectas. Eh, ¿Qué es lo que significaba esto? Que por una parte, algunos de ellos incorporaban indicadores en las evaluaciones que habían sido proporcionados por los mecanismos de adelanto de la mujer, o los institutos de igualdad, o los ministerios de igualdad, o los sistemas de igualdad de género en los países. Eh, sin embargo, no siempre esos indicadores dialogaban con el tipo de iniciativas que estaba siendo evaluada. Por lo tanto, ahí había un desfase entre eh, la probabilidad, el deseo y la apertura para incorporar indicadores de género en las evaluaciones eh, que no siempre se adherían o se avenían de buena manera con los propios indicadores que estaban previstos en la evaluación. Después, otra manera de incluirlo fue a propósito de que en algunos países se desarrollaron planes de igualdad nacionales eh, que estaban siendo compatibles o eran amigables con los grandes planes de desarrollo del país. Por lo tanto, ahí sí había posibilidad de diálogo, habían indicadores comunes y por lo tanto la inclusión de la perspectiva de género transversal en el Estado se veía reflejada en estos planes nacionales de desarrollo y por lo tanto al evaluar esos planes de desarrollo vía evaluaciones más específicas de políticas, de programas o proyectos era más sencillo poder articular el conjunto de las mediciones con la inclusión del enfoque de género. Y en otros casos también habían fórmulas indirectas en la medida que los institutos de estadística eh, que habían estado trabajando la desagregación de datos por sexo en los países de manera sistemática, cuyos funcionarios y funcionarias muchas veces recibieron formación y capacitación en temas de género, permitía también que las distintas evaluaciones pudieran disponer de una cantidad y calidad de datos que fuera interesante a la hora de evaluar y a la hora de analizar eh, esa información desde la perspectiva de la igualdad de género. 
Sí, bueno, ¿qué aprendimos con toda esta experiencia? Varias cosas. A mí me interesa resaltar algunas de ellas con más fuerza a la luz de, de lo que significa entonces incluir las evaluaciones eh, con igualdad de género en el marco de los ODS. Eh, ahí tienen ustedes algunas de las, de las distinciones, de la descripción de, de estos aprendizajes. Eh, por lo tanto, en relación a los tipos de institucionalidad y a los tipos de agencias especializadas que se han creado en, en la región de América Latina, eh, hay dos cuestiones claves. ¿no? Por una parte, la fragmentación de la función de evaluación en el Estado, que es una cuestión que se repite, Muchos de ellos, de estos países, tienen la función de evaluación y seguimiento dispersa y en algunos casos la propia función de evaluación también dispersa en distintas instituciones públicas, ya sea dependientes de los ministerios de haciendas o finanzas y además de los ministerios sociales, o a veces en todos los ministerios sociales hay unidades de evaluación y además una comisión asesora en la presidencia. O sea, nos encontramos con una dispersión y fragmentación eh, importante de mirar a la hora de, de revisar la, el tipo de, y las características de esa institucionalidad. Eh, en segundo lugar, también aparece el tema de las capacidades eh, en relación a lo que requiere esta institucionalidad. En este estudio, yo les decía, preguntamos muchísimas cosas, entrevistamos a muchas personas, funcionarios de nivel de autoridad, pero también funcionarios técnicos de los sistemas y a muchas personas vinculadas a los temas de evaluación en cada uno de los países. Y todos ellos nos señalaban la necesidad de contar con mecanismos y con eh, modalidades de fortalecimiento de sus capacidades, dado que reconocían no saber nada de género. Entonces, a estas alturas del siglo es muy común encontrarse con funcionarios en los gobiernos que tienen voluntad política, que tienen sensibilidad frente al tema y que, sin embargo, no saben cómo aplicar el tema de género. Eh, entonces, ahí también hay una, una cuestión muy interesante de mirar. Nosotros eh, capacitamos durante estos cuatro o cinco años a más de mil personas en conjunto con, con ONU Mujeres en toda la región, en todos los países de la región, descubriendo que hay una muy alta rotación de funcionarios y por lo tanto también hay que hacer esfuerzos en las capacitaciones por generar eh, memoria institucional y capacidad institucional más que individual. Eh, otras de las cuestiones interesantes es que todavía el acento de la evaluación de las políticas está orientada a los promedios, no tanto a las brechas, por lo tanto ahí hay que hacer un cambio de enfoque, un cambio de mirada respecto de la consigna de nadie se quede atrás eh, y también porque tenemos que incorporar evaluaciones que midan los procesos, que midan la capacidad de gestión del Estado, que midan la gerencia. Tenemos una subgerencia muy grande en los programas sociales en nuestros países, por lo tanto hay que ser capaces de dimensionar qué significa eso para la implementación de la Agenda 2030. Por otra parte, eh, hay una exigencia, una demanda muy fuerte respecto de esto de, de las capacidades y tenemos que ser hoy día muy selectivos respecto de los contenidos que hay que abordar en la perspectiva de, el, del enfoque de igualdad de género. Hay que construir una batería básica mínima de contenidos, dado la alta rotación de funcionarios públicos. Sin embargo, también eh, es necesario contar con una masa crítica cada vez más grande que pueda tener... Eh, el enfoque de género en el ADN profesional. Lo que necesitamos es gente que no solo tenga la sensibilidad, sino que tenga las herramientas, las capacidades para incorporar la evaluación en todo el proceso de evaluación, ¿no? independientemente de su rol. Y respecto de las alianzas, también es muy interesante en este estudio, nos dimos cuenta de que habían tres elementos fundamentales en estos procesos de instalación, por una parte la voluntad política de la cual siempre hablamos en estas conferencias, eh, en el caso de América Latina es un tema muy relevante, los funcionarios y funcionarias de la región son disciplinados respecto de su autoridad, por lo tanto en la medida que tenemos autoridades consistentes y claramente sensibles y que adhieren a los principios de la Agenda 2030 y de la Agenda de Igualdad de Género, vamos a tener entonces funcionarios que también van a percibir y se van a alinear frente a estas necesidades de la agenda de este minuto. 
Por otra parte, el respaldo de Naciones Unidas ha sido clave en este proceso, el interés y acción decidida que tuvo ONU Mujeres durante estos últimos cinco años en la región de América Latina de acercarse a la institucionalidad pública, a los gobiernos, dialogar, generar espacios de capacitación, guías de trabajo, eh, un montón de asistencia técnica que hemos desarrollado incluso en conjunto en muchos países de la región ha sido clave para poder avanzar en este sentido y que hoy día no tengamos la misma fotografía del 2014, sino que tengamos gobiernos mucho más decididos a intervenir y cambiar su, su institucionalidad y su metodología. Eh, y finalmente decir de que eh, solo me queda, eh, no voy a explicar nada de este diagrama, porque creo que se explica por sí solo, eh, solo decir de que a raíz de este estudio, pero también a raíz de la experiencia que hemos tenido en América Latina, pensamos de que estamos en un momento histórico muy importante en que hay que adelantar, que hay que apurar el vínculo y el trabajo de las organizaciones que estamos aquí en esta tarde sentados, eh, que tenemos una apertura y una sensibilidad frente a la importancia de estos temas, tenemos que relacionarnos con los gobiernos, inevitablemente. Hay que hacer un trabajo decidido, sistemático, estratégico con los gobiernos de los distintos países del mundo para la inclusión del enfoque de género, de manera también que la, el, el enfoque de igualdad de género pueda ser transversalizado a la evaluación en todos sus procesos, ¿no? desde la perspectiva de derechos, que hablemos de derechos vulnerados y derechos garantizados, que hablemos de la posibilidad de incluir, además de los clásicos estándares de criterios del CAD, de participación, o sea, de, incluso de pertinencia o relevancia, coherencia, eficiencia, etcétera, que nos propongamos también entonces incluir el criterio de género, el criterio de inclusión y el criterio de participación como criterios de calidad en nuestras evaluaciones. Ese es un desafío sobre el cual hay que trabajar decididamente y también incluir, como decía Inga hace un rato, de con mucha fuerza decirles que la importancia de incluir a los colectivos más rezagados a las organizaciones de mujeres, a las ONGs que han hecho estudios y que han trabajado en teoría de género y en acción de género para revertir las desigualdades, es un asunto clave en América Latina, pero considero que también es clave a estas alturas del siglo en todo el mundo. Muchísimas gracias. I will speak very fast uh, because I know people want to ask questions and you, I'm sure you already have burning questions. So I'm... Um, going to talk to you about evaluating SDGs uh, with an equity uh, focus and gender equality uh, lens. And I'm going to talk about the experience of evolved gender. So um, I'll tell you why I am from Africa and then talking about evolved gender, which is working throughout the world, but you'll get to know why later. So just um, an overview, um, I'll, do, I'll introduce to you evolved gender. And then I'll talk about um, evaluating SDGs, um, key achievements, and um, you know lessons learned uh, based on evolved gender's experience, and then some implications for national evaluation um, capacities. So that's what I'm going to focus on. So really about evolved gender. Um, I think uh, Inga touched a bit on it, uh, but just to um, uh, you know reinforce that evolved gender is a global multi-stakeholder. Um, Partnership under Eval Partners. So um, under Eval Gender, I represent the, um, you know, AFRIA, which is a regional um, evaluation association based in Africa, um, which is an umbrella body for evaluation associations in Africa. So um, gender is a key um, area for us and uh, equity-focused, um, you know, evaluations. So the goal for Eval Gender is uh, to strengthen demand, supply and quality of equity focused and gender responsive evaluations. And uh, Eval Gender contributes to sustainable, equitable, and gender responsive policies through strengthening capacities to evaluate the SDGs with an equity focused and gender uh, responsive um, lens. So uh, we do this through uh, working through uh, national evaluation associations um, So we do this uh, through nation, uh, strengthening national evaluation associations in different, um, you know, uh, through working through national evaluation associations through different countries, civil society, 
parliamentarians and um, you know uh, governments. So I am too short. I can't even see from here. But anyway, <laughs> so so we work through uh, you know those se uh, several organisations because as I said, it's a partnership. So one of um, the things that we do is to uh, support. Um, organizations, maybe uh, the one previous project we did is through giving them grants uh, to strengthen, um, you know, evaluating SDGs from a, 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 an equity focused and gender responsive um, uh, lens. So um, as you heard from uh, Inga, uh, Eval Gender gave support to 11 countries and they were with technical support from UN Women. And my focus of this presentation is to just talk about um, a few uh, results that we achieved through working with uh, or supporting these countries. And we are going to be uh, looking just at a few examples. And you, you can see that some of um, our gender support, um, you know, uh, created a sort of a catalytic, catalytic effect where we then got other organizations getting interested in looking at equity focus and gender responsive uh, evaluations and supporting different countries. So, um, looking at country-specific examples. So, for example, when we look at Cambodia, um, if our gender supported uh, Cambodia to, um, uh, to develop national equity focus and gender responsive evaluation guidelines for the evaluation of uh, Cam um, Cambodia's SDGs, uh, national strategic development plan, and strategic uh, programs, um, you know, so, so these guidelines were specific uh, to support um, the national, uh, the you know, development of national, um, you know, evaluation within the countries. So, really strengthening country um, uh, capacities to evaluate using a gender and equ equity-focused uh, lens. If we look at Nepal, so the national, there was a national workshop uh, on um, eval, S, um, eval SDGs and eval gender in um, um, to integrate um, equity focus and gender responsive lens to national evaluation. This led to the development of an integrated plan and action to, um, plan of action to strengthen gender and equity um, responsive evaluations and methodologies and processes towards effective um, achievement of the uh, sustainable development goals. So um, there was also um, support given to Sri Lanka. You see that I'll speak more about Sri Lanka because I've just come from Sri Lanka where I, now I get to know uh, the impact that this initial support of evolved gender had on, um, on Sri Lanka. So from Sri Lanka, uh, in Sri Lanka, evolved gender supported parliamentarian session and workshop to de develop national evaluation plan. And um, this led to support from other organizations like UNICEF, for example, to uh, you know, to develop uh, uh, equity focused and gender responsive national evaluation guidelines, which is actually in the process right now. And also the training in districts, um, in the several districts, which is really supported by, um, you know, really uh, with great support from uh, parliamentarians and obviously with support from UNICEF. But I think what I want to show here is that a small grant can actually lead to more understanding of why we need to have equity um, focus and gender responsive evaluations and then some other partners come on board and then we ignite interest from different parts of government to um, make sure that um, evaluations are done from an equity focus and gender responsive uh, lens. Uh, I, I, uh, Sri Lanka is also in the process of developing a diploma curriculum in evaluation uh, which is um, uh, equity focused and gender responsive. So you, um, we, I, I'm very, very um, intrigued about the work that is being done in Sri Lanka and um, the support that they've received from the government and from the parliament and the uh, involvement of the parliament specifically in the area of evaluation. Zimbabwe, my own country. So with Zimbabwe, <laughs> there was a workshop um, that um, was held to support um, Zimbabwe parliamentarians, national evaluation associations, national statistical office, um, and you know, other government ministries uh, you know, to evaluate SDGs from uh, an equity-focused and um, gender-responsive lens. 
And this actually led to a ripple effect where then um, there was a lot of interest after they developed an action plan, there was a, a lot of interest from parliamentarians that we're actually asking to say, we want more of this. How can we ensure that we learn how to do it this better? In fact, they wanted actually to influence the budget uh, at the time to say, listen, we want to know more about equity focus and gender responsive evaluation so that we can see how to use the evidence to influence the budget. So it's not, I, sometimes it can look like just a workshop, but what happens after the workshop is actually key because then you are getting people knowing more about the raising awareness and then they demand more uh, um, information around the area. Uh, in addition, um, the Zimbabwe government is also receiving support from uh, UN Women to de develop um, equity focus and gender responsive um, national monitoring and evaluation guidelines. And I think you will hear more about this on Friday. My colleague from the government of Zimbabwe will uh, talk more about it. In terms of... Um, we, as you heard, we and if all gender supported uh, 11 countries, but I only had time to just share with you just five examples. But then um, I think what is key is that there are certain some lessons learned from this um, from this whole uh, initiative, even though sometimes it may look uh, you know like it was a, just a drop in the ocean. We've seen that there's a a lot of uh, you know um, ripple effect that is taking place. So grants from Evolve Gender are catalytic, and I've shared um, why I say that they are catalytic. And then this has led to greater interest and more um, initiatives around equity focus and gender responsive um, uh, you know, evaluations with support from other interested parties. There's also a willingness, willingness among governments and parliamentarians to learn about and implement equity focus and gender responsive evaluations. Uh, I think of all countries that implemented, I didn't hear of a country that said, no, they said we're not interested anymore or we're not interested to carry on. So I think the idea is to know that there is interest. And so how do we then uh, satisfy this interest that is out there, I think is key. It's also best to ensure that uh, equity focus and gender responsive uh, evaluations um, are, you know, uh, are done from right from, the, I mean, gender is incorporated right from the start rather than an afterthought. So the fact that not many countries have national evaluation policies and systems, um, you know, is, is an opportunity because then we, you can then see how you can support the development of national evaluation policies and systems, ensuring that they are equity focused and they are gender responsive. And I think that's one lesson that we learned during this implementation. And we also realized that capacities on evaluation as a whole are limited, and specifically around equity focus and gender responsive evaluations. So there's an opportunity to uh, grow that and make sure that we um, disseminate more knowledge around that. And lastly, you know, we know that more work still has to be done, and this is very important. So what are the implications for national evaluation capacities um, based on the work that um, Eval Gender did? So as I said before, opportunities exist for uh, equity focus and gender responsive evaluation systems and policies at national level. And I think they, you know, it's important that more people come together to do this work. And because right now the implementation is fragmented, so you can't quite see uh, the impact or the results uh, at, at country level. So it's important that civil society, I mean, Sometimes we include national evaluation associations in civil society, but I want to separate them. Civil society, national evaluation associations, development, development partners, parliamentarians, and governments come together to uh, strengthen their national evaluation systems and um, ensure that um, they are gender responsive and equity focused. And also, this will, will really yield a greater um, impact, and we can begin to uh, see the results of the work that is being done by different organizations uh, in, in, and different partners all over the world. So basically, this is the work that I wanted to share, and I can, I'm open to answer any questions as they are quite, there's a, quite a lot of countries that are benefiting, and we can discuss more about it. Thank you. So thank you very much for our presenters sharing their experiences, organizational experiences, regional, national experiences about integrating gender and human rights into the national evaluation systems and evaluation. So now I would like to open the floor for the discussion. 
So please introduce yourself and try to keep your comments or questions short because we're a bit running out of time. But everybody has an opportunity to ask any burning questions. So please, the floor is open. I'll, I'll, I will be very brief um, because I know there are a number of questions uh, uh, related to other aspects of what we discussed this afternoon. Um, of course, I have I've been to and worked in Zambia, but I'm not familiar with the, the planning process and how it deals with persons with disabilities. So I can't say sp in terms of specifically um, uh, to, to that situation, except to, in, in a, perhaps a more general way, um, uh, indicate that we know that it's a difficult effort to move to a rights-based approach. We, we try uh, in each of our countries and each of our governments to stress that especially when they have taken, uh, when they've ratified a convention or they've taken a, a, a stand, and in this case if, uh, uh, of those who have ratified the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, it suggests there are expectations in terms of, of, of taking a rights-based approach. I don't recall whether Zambia is one that that, uh, that also uh, agreed to the additional protocol, which actually has even more binding a aspects to it. But those are that's the kind of first step of how we put this into to planning. Let's go back to the government and say, what did you agree that you would do, and how do we then um, help to support uh, the implementation of that? Having said all that, we are always going to encounter difficulties in then moving from planning to implementation when it comes to persons with disabilities because we've gone for so long with them uh, a closed off, uh, kept out of the way, both, both institutional, uh, institutionalized or their family keeping them away. And so it's going to be a long process for us as we bring in to these, uh, to, to, uh, these persons to, to, to be able to exercise those rights. And, and perhaps um, we can speak also during the, during the uh, uh, breaks that we can talk a little bit more about that because I, I know you're struggling with it and, uh, and I think many other countries are, are facing that as well. Thank you. Thank you for your interest for the Tunisian uh, study case on participation in politics, essentially for women. And um, let me tell you the opportunities of uh, legal framework. Uh, after the revolution, the law of elections gave parity for uh, legislative elections. And in every list, you have to find men, women. It was the parity at the vertical sense. But you are not given the same opportunities to men or women. And to ensure that every political party have to put 50% of list with head of the list women and 50% list of the head of the list men. So now we make the amendment for the, uh, and it was ratified to be sure that um, um, give equality of chances to men and women to be sure to increase from 34% to go for 50% and uh, starting with the next elections on local, uh, at the local level. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias por el interés. Eh, respecto de la pregunta sobre el norte, eh, que nos hacía aquí la amiga de, de Túnez, eh, creo que hoy día ha quedado en evidencia esta lógica que hemos tenido durante muchos años de trabajar, de hacer política pública, pero también de informar y de evaluar sobre la base de los promedios, ¿no? y, y eso de alguna manera ha invisibilizado las brechas incluso al interior de los países más desarrollados. Entonces tenemos ahí una deuda respecto de dónde están los grupos más rezagados, dónde están las principales problemáticas, dónde está la vulneración de derechos en los países del norte. Eh, yo puedo decir que, por ejemplo, bajo esta lógica de los promedios, en el caso chileno, que no es un país del norte, aunque algunos chilenos lo crean, eh, hemos notado a raíz de un estudio que hizo el PNUD eh, durante varios años de medición de los ODM en el país, eh, en donde el rezago de los pueblos indígenas respecto a la población no indígena, por ejemplo, es de alrededor de 10 años. Entonces, ¿eso qué es lo que nos muestra? Que tenemos una población 
que está absolutamente marginada respecto de la pertinencia que tiene la política pública en el país. Entonces, si seguimos haciendo política pública pensando en los promedios nacionales, seguramente se nos van a ir quedando atrás aquellos grupos que ya sabemos que son los que tienen más desventaja, los que viven en zonas rurales, los que son indígenas respecto a los no indígenas, las mujeres respecto a los hombres, dentro del universo mujeres, las niñas y las adultas mayores más que las mujeres en edad promedio. O sea, en cada una de las dimensiones del desarrollo podemos encontrar en todos los países del mundo, incluyendo los del norte, eh, aquellos grupos que están en una situación de desventaja mayor y que por lo tanto vale la pena esta vez diseñar políticas, no solo las políticas estandarizadas para igualar y para subir el nivel de desarrollo de todos en la sociedad, sino también cómo hacer políticas específicas y focalizadas, no estandarizadas para aquellos grupos que lo requieren. Eh, y en ese sentido también eh, trato o intento de contestar la otra pregunta respecto de las políticas públicas estandarizadas para la igualdad. En el caso de Uruguay, por ejemplo, hay una experiencia muy interesante que mirar respecto de política pública. Ellos han hecho políticas estandarizadas respecto de cuestiones estructurales de la desigualdad, como son el tema de la economía de los cuidados. Han desarrollado una política pública para todo el país en torno a resolver la, la problemática de los cuidados y la sobrecarga de lo doméstico y los cuidados en las mujeres y sin embargo al mismo tiempo han sido capaces de diseñar políticas muy específicas con un foco tremendamente específico en el caso por ejemplo de las mujeres transexuales que son a juicio de los equipos técnicos del Uruguay aquellas que están en un mayor rezago respecto de igualdad de oportunidades, acceso a los recursos, a oportunidades laborales, etcétera. Entonces creo que ahí hay algo interesante que mirar respecto de innovación en el diseño de política pública. Y por último, respecto de, de esta pregunta que me hacía acá la colega sobre el tema de, de la maduración de la institucionalidad de evaluación, eh, lo que quise decir ahí y que, y que de alguna manera compartimos también con... Eh, con la compañera aquí de Valgender, eh, respecto del de momento histórico en que estamos y la oportunidad que tenemos de incluir los asuntos de género en la evaluación, eh, dice relación con que la experiencia de América Latina, en la medida que las instituciones van generando mayor eh, solidez, mayor robustez en su propia institucionalidad, eso implica que también van generando documentos, materiales, guías, directrices, capacitaciones, formatos, procedimientos, etcétera, de una manera mucho más estandarizada y sistemática. ¿no? Empiezan a repetir una serie de procedimientos, de estándares, etcétera. En la medida que esas instituciones van madurando y por lo tanto van consolidando ese conjunto de instrumental, de dispositivos organizativos, etcétera, si es que no incorporamos desde el inicio el género, es mucho más difícil incorporarlo después. Porque la mayoría de las veces lo que dicen las autoridades es que nos ha costado cinco años instalar este procedimiento. Entonces, ¿cómo ahora vamos a incorporar enfoque de género? Entonces, el momento en que estamos hoy día, en donde toda esta institucionalidad es más incipiente, está desarrollando innovación, está pensando en cambios institucionales, es un momento clave, es una oportunidad clave para que desde el inicio empiecen a incorporar estos procedimientos. Ya sabemos todos los que estamos aquí lo que ha costado en los propios censos, en las encuestas de hogares, Incluir a veces una pregunta que lo único que hace es desagregar por sexo, edad, etnicidad, zona de residencia. O sea, ese tipo de cuestiones que además es muy caro, es muy difícil cuando las instituciones ya llevan un proceso de maduración contundente. Entonces creemos que en el momento en que las instituciones están creando sus procedimientos, sus normas, sus estándares, sus, sus encuestas incluso, de uso del tiempo o de otras, es un momento clave, es una oportunidad clave para no solo diseñar eso en conjunto con quienes tienen la expertise para hacerlo, sino también para seguir desarrollando innovaciones conjuntamente.